Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, Vice Chancellor of OP Jindal Global University, all the other dignitaries who are present and who are on the dais, Justices Shri A.K. Patnak, Shri Swatantar Kumar, Shri Arjan Kumar Sikri, and Shri Madan Lokur, former judges of the Supreme Court of India. All the other senior advocates who are present here, all the learned advocates, members of the faculty of the university, all the other dignitaries who are present here. I consider myself to be privileged before, to be before this August gathering. This represents truly the cross-sections of whoever matters when it comes to dispensation of justice. And I couldn't have asked for a better gathering, a better audience than this. Similarly, I consider myself privileged that I have been invited to be a speaker in what is called Krishna Iyer Memorial Lecture Series. Though the subject is, there are three facets, constitutionalism, rule of law and access to justice. Each facet, each aspect in itself is impossible to be covered in a span of 45 minutes. Therefore, I have chosen as a tribute to Justice Krishna here to deal with some of his judgments and principally on the issue of access to justice. I consider him to be a visionary I consider him to be a man with tremendous foresight who has developed, who has charted out course which we are still following even after 50 years. And therefore, here I am before you dealing with some of the judgments, some of the contributions made by this great visionary. I saw Justice Krishnaya for the first time when as a student I had visited Supreme Court to see the proceedings in re-special court. It was a seven judge combination. Krishnaya was number three judge. Justice Chandrachur, Justice Bhagwati, Krishnaya. That was sometime in 79-80. I had still not joined the law college then. Whatever was going on by way of discussion was like a bouncer to me. But I had found three heroes of mine sitting on that bench. And then thereafter, as a student of law, when you start reading some of his judgments, what impressed the students in those ages was some of the quotations coming from Justice Krishnaya's judgment. What felicity of language, what command over the expressions. We saw one message which was being read to us. That's one example. But from the judgments, take for instance Samshir Singh, when he wanted to convey that we are closer to English legal system than the American legal system, the expression he uses is, not the Potomac, but the Thames. But the Thames fertilizes the flow of river Yamuna. What a beautiful expression. That was in Samshir Singh. In that Mahajan's case, which was agrarian reforms, he wanted to convey that the courts must be guided first by 
what the constitution commands. If you understand the constitution, every adjudicatory process will be easier. So what does he say? If we grasp dharma of the constitution, karma of adjudication will be an easier task. What a beautiful expression again. We are also familiar with his bail and not jail is the standard norm. That was again one more expression. Or in the Shiv Shankar Dal Mill, he wanted to convey this and he says, Dharma of the situation demands that the state shall not plead limitation against its citizen. What a beautiful way to put it. So we were all as students of law completely to be impressed. If I say I was impressed, that would be completely an understatement. We all hero worshipped him. I had seen only the man that fleeting sort of, you know, moments when he was part of the bench. I had one occasion when he had formed a group called Independent Initiative and he had asked three or four advocates to cover a by-election in Haryana. I think Rini George was also part of that group where I had gone there. And after we covered the election and came back, we had that chance meeting with Justice Krishna here himself. That was the only time that I could have conversation with that great man. But we say in Marathi, Ajimya Brahma Pahile, that is, to translate in English, Oh my God, I have seen the God himself today. So that was the impression that we always carried. Now some of the statistics. Justice Krishnayar was appointed as judge in 1968. 73, five years and 15 days to be precise the man was elevated to Supreme Court. The Constitution demands minimum five years as judge of the High Court before a person can be elevated. This man required 15 more days. One of the shortest and quickest elevation to the Supreme Court. Five years as judge of the High Court, seven years as judge of the Supreme Court. Mind you, the tenure in Supreme Court was longer than what his tenure as judge of the High Court. Out of those five years, for almost two and a half years, Justice Krishna Iyer was member of the Law Commission. And in 72, 71 was the committee, 72 is the report. Government of India appointed a committee to go into issues including dispensation of legal aid to the deprived sections or the marginalized sections of the society. Krishna here as member of law commission was the chairperson of the committee. Amongst those who also included who were members of the committee were Dr. L. M. Singhvi, Dr. Madhava Menon, and M.K. Ramamurthy, learned senior advocate of the court. Their report, I consider to be magna carta on the issue of legal aid. Some of the observations in that report are so prophetic that they'll hold good, they still hold good even after 50 years and they will always hold good, perhaps, God knows, maybe centuries hereafter. That was the first report, which, 72 comes the report, 
by the time the legal services act was enacted it was in 87 so 15 years it took us two father figures who have led the movement of legal aid from the front justice krishna here and justice bhagwati the report refers to the series of meetings with Justice Bhagwati, who was then the Chief Justice of Gujarat High Court. And I'll place some of the passages from that report to say that what a great vision the man had. He said, to put it very bluntly and very in a very crude manner, that legal aid to the poor does not mean poor legal aid. And what does one require for that? The contribution from the members of the bar. The members of the bar, the leaders at the bar, those who are established, who are senior advocates, must render pro bono services, number one. Number two, he also said that law students must also be engrafted in the entire movement. If we think in terms of access to justice, what Krishnaya's prophetic words were, that you can't have access to justice or the principle satisfied if most of the population doesn't have the benefit of good quality legal assistance. May I therefore now just place those two or three passages from the committee's report and then we will discuss further. What he says in those reports is, if legal aid is an entitlement of those eligible for it, rather than a charitable gift, then the mere attempt at assistance is not praiseworthy. Absent high quality of service leading to favorable results. This implies that legal aid cannot be left as a part-time avocation of well-intentioned private persons or judicial administrators whose principal careers lie outside the ambit of legal aid. It implies the need for development of specialized skills of advocacy and administration and recruitment and training of specialized personnel whose knowledge and experience may be systematically perpetuated. There must be people at the central, state and grassroots level for whom legal aid is a full-time crusade and career around whom the useful part-timers and volunteers may be deployed. This is so far as the lawyers are concerned. Now the students. Legal aid in its dynamic aspects can strike root in our country only if poverty law with student legal aid is a clinical component of education becomes a universal feature in the law schools. You can't reach the, teach the student except through the teacher and so it is crucial that we legate law teachers organizationally with the movement. For this reason, the president of the all India Law Teachers Association may ex officio serve on the authority. We have already explained that the legal aid scheme we envisage is not merely court-centered, but is a social welfare project spreading out into the country. Representation at the national authority level to an all India body engaged in social work becomes a pertinent, the choice being made by the union government. There is an additional benefit to student involvement in legal aid work, where a continuing interchange between clinical work 
and curricular studies takes place, the theoretical equipment of the student from the point of view of law and poverty is enriched. The clinic will broaden the interest of law professors and stimulate increased scholarship in the field of the poor man's problems. The academic cloister of the law teacher will disappear eventually and the classes and the clinics will conjointly focus more attention on the issues which affect the backward segments of the community. The creative use of law students in a country with financial and other resource scarcity will reduce the burden on the legal aid institution. We regard the inauguration of a university schemes for conversion of the raw enthusiasm of the law student into a potent resource on behalf of the poor litigant as of import. We have legal aid centers in various colleges, universities, etc. But how many those who really deserve and want legal aid actually reach those centers? Very less. So therefore there is a need now to go into the society, out into and amongst the members of the society. This is what the thought which gets expressed. 72 is the report. We are in 2022. Yet, those words have still not attained reality. We at Legal Aid Centers, we are trying to achieve that. And that's why I said this report is a magna carta on the subject of legal aid. Why does he choose this legal aid? In various judgments after judgment, his emphasis is on dispensation of legal aid to the marginalized and to the poor sections. This he elevates to the level of, this is how we will empower them, this is how we will be able to, in true sense of the term, satisfy what is contemplated by the expression access to justice. Now some of the statistical now details. In seven years, Justice Krishna here was party to 799 judgments, out of which 413 judgments were authored by him. He was part of 58 constitution bench decisions in seven years out of which 25 were authored by him. Out of 25, 17 in a five-judge combination and eight in a seven-judge combination. What a tremendous achievement for a person. I must tell you, I have completed seven years in Supreme Court. I haven't had the occasion to be part of the Constitution bench for more than six matters. The destiny gave the nature, the God gave him opportunity and what a best, what fantastic utilization by the man. 58 constitution bench decisions in a span of seven years. Now having dealt with this access to justice issue, let us see how he translates all these thoughts into some of his judgments. The first one is Bar Council of Maharashtra versus M. V. Dabolkar. Again, dealing with the role of lawyers, what the lawyers must do. The bar is not a private guild like that of barbers, butchers, and candlestick makers, but by bold contrast, a public institution committed to public justice and pro bono publico service. The grant of a monopoly license to practice law is based on three assumptions. There is socially useful function for the lawyer to perform. The lawyer is a professional person who will perform that function. And third, 
his performance as a professional person is regulated by himself not more formally by the profession as a whole then the responsibility of the bar to lend services to the needy that was discussed in a judgment called kishor singh ravinder dev versus state of rajasthan the whole bar if it has a larger dedication is amicus curiae because no cause should be dearer to a people oriented justice centered profession despite its esoteric genes elitist strands and lucrative slant than to be a decisive actor in the democracy of judicial remedies so that no man be he poor poor man or prisoner dissenter delinquent eccentric or extremist shall suffer what the law forbids in this court the members of the bar whenever called upon by the bench have kept the door ajar and unfailingly help the court as free janitors of justice and free forensic functionaries at the service of any one aggrieved by injustice and seeking legal justice after all the great proposition that inspires the calling of justicing by the bench and the bar alike is best expressed by dr martin luther king in his letter from alabama prison injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly and then thereafter so long as an iron curtain divides the law set by the constitution and lit by the supreme court from the minions of the state so long shall this court's writ remain a mystic myth, myth and harmless half truth making law in the books and law in action distant neighbors mr p h parekh had perhaps i think appeared as a micus cura in that matter if his vision is translated in reality the term access to justice will have a real meaning it will give flesh and blood and become a throbbing and dynamic concept making all citizen equal in terms of opportunities and protection krishna iyer was a very prolific writer some of his writings also depict the same thoughts in one of his writing he says access to justice in the new world legal order is a foremost human right access to justice is a foremost human right the panchashil of the indian justice process which can fulfill the aforesaid human right calls for a one simplification of procedure two early finality of adjudication with less number of decks of appeals three inexpensive inexpensiveness in legal services and innovation of new methodology to bring the poor closer to the court for technological transformation by which paper logging can be eliminated quick communication between client and court can be achieved and high tech input plus affirmative action and remedial changes which will open up facilities for forensic locomotion prompt just and fair and fifth elimination of the rituals of procedure and fossils of legal praxis and discovery of dispute resolution alternatives through conciliation informal hearings arbitrations people's mass settlement courts into bracket lok adalats and the like what a beautiful way to put it in five panchashil what he says it carries everything this writing is of 1993 today we have e courts today we have e platforms virtual platforms where we are using technology innovations to our advantage the man had the foresight to put it as one of the principles on which you may base access to justice he had that foresight to put it that yes alternative mechanisms adr 
like mediation, etc., that is also part of the process. In another writing, he says, the rule of law must run close to the rule of life. If economic inequality handicaps men seeking relief in court, the rule of law must insist upon the obliteration of that disability so that qualitatively equal opportunity to place their case before the court may be available to the rich and poor alike. In short, if a large section of a community is not to suffer from a sense of alienation due to denial of justice, a progressive scheme of state legal aid is unavoidable. This was a writing way back in 1976. 87 comes our formal statutory provision. 76, around the same time, 39A gets added by way of 42nd Constitution Amendment. What do we find? Has this concept actually materialized? Do we really have valid programs which satisfy what he had thought of? Day in and day out, what we find is an empty ritualistic kind of approach which is exhibited by those who are given the charge and given the briefs to appear on legal aid issues. We as judges who man the process, we are only facilitator. We can lay down norms, we can lay down everything, we can actually engage the services. The final dispensation of legal aid in court is only through lawyers. What we find is, and please pardon me if I again burden you with some statistics. In India, court-based litigation legal aid is just about 5% of all the matters. If 60% of, of our population is below poverty line, then that percentage doesn't match with the reality. Where have the 55 other percentage people gone? They are the ones who sell their properties, the ornaments of their wives, mortgage everything to pay the fees of the lawyers. And finally, they land up as destitutes. If the legal aid program is vibrant, if there is sense of confidence that yes, even if I go through this door, which is marked legal aid, my destination is assured. Quality legal aid is assured. Quality legal dispensation of services is assured. Then people may not choose to go through the door which requires mortgaging of their assets. And that perhaps is what the great man had thought of, that legal aid will be where rich and poor will be treated alike. My experience as person in charge of legal aid is, you may increase the fees to whatever level, we cannot match the fees which the council in market can demand and command. It's impossible. The entire framework of legal aid will survive and can function only if the lawyers make their contributions. I use this platform, please pardon me, but this is to convey a message because this is the premier law school The lawyers who train, who come out of this law school must have that sense of commitment. If we have that commitment, then only we'll be paying a great tribute to this man. Continuing further. The importance of universal legal access to social justice was stressed by him in another writing. 
we must accept as an axiom of a progressive order that our republic will run on the rails of rule of law only through universal legal access to social justice the reality is that law as a delivery agent of justice is in the hands of quote unquote property limited in a land of quote unquote poverty unlimited or again a beautiful expression property limited in the hands of property limited in a land of poverty unlimited and the revolutionary task of the legal profession in its larger connotation is to expand access to justice by radicalizing conceptually and practically the legal system this jurisprudential technology is the challenge to the creative lawyer and is a sine qua non for promotion of community credul credulity in legality the alternative is clear for those who care to chant the rule of law after they read the writing on the wall and this is the writing on the wall that we must we must read that we must assume it assimilate it and make it part of our system this is only one part access to justice and i wanted to place it before you that for this great man access to justice meant what it meant that whether rich or poor the doors of justice must open in the same fashion must treat him in the same fashion and every possible opportunity or protection must be made available to him that according to him was access to justice if you ensure that then rule of law will also get ensured now let us see as as a judge how did he translate his ideas mind you justice krishna iyer was compassion personified he had compassion at every level i must tell you just last week i was a part of a bench which was hearing a plea for commutation of death sentence to life on the ground that the man was kept in solitary confinement for 11 years naturally the best case possible to rely on was sunil batra sunil batra was a case dealt with by five judges of this court supreme court leading judgment by justice da desai speaking for himself and three brothers a concurring judgment by justice krishna iyer initially when the matter had come before a bench of three judges krishna iyer was part of that just is big and kailasam were the other members all three of them visited tihar jail to see the conditions which were prevalent in the jail then they made a report and based on that report certain observations thereafter were made by both the judgments just as krishna iyer's judgment though it's a concurring judgment it's a treatise in itself one interesting feature all judgments by justice krishna iyer or the judgments where he was a party one noticeable feature is justice krishna iyer was never in minority or he was not part of a dissenting note he was either on the majority or concurring with the majority always and that shows the capacity of this man at not only the succeeding generations even the brothers on the bench they would always go by what justice krishna iyer thought it to be the correct way there is one an interesting passage in a book which is written by abhinav chandrachur and 
he had interviewed Justice Krishnayer and put one or two questions to him. That why is it that there is no dissent? He said that I did not believe in dissent. Then uh, another question. There is a criticism that your concurring judgments are actually dissenting notes. <laughs> Krishnayer smilingly said, some people do think that way, yes. So, coming back to the topic, this concurring judgment in Sunil Batra shows what compassion the man had. He gives various examples. He says that in a solitary confinement where you are confined in 8 by 8 or 8 by 10 room with bare minimum kind of comforts. It may be a boon or blessing in disguise for a yogi, but for a normal man that will break the, the mental frame of that man. And he goes on to say that that would be absolutely barbaric to tell you in just few words. So that is one part where compassion driven that yes, this is what is required. And the concept of justice getting changed according to situations or the norms which are required to be utilized. Therefore, the Prison Act provisions, they interpreted it in such a way that seclusion or segregation of a person who has been given death sentence can happen only when the death sentence is confirmed as a last resort. That is, the Supreme Court appeals, etc. are finished, reviews are finished, and even the mercy petition is rejected by the president. Then only you may segregate the man, not immediately after the Sessions Court judgment. And that's when Sunil Batra, how it was decided. Now it's another thing whether such a thing happens, whether the death sentence should be commuted to life. We are grappling with that point. That's a different issue altogether. Now coming back to his, some of the contributions made by this man. Hiralal Malik versus State of Bihar was a case where this case was decided in 77. A 12 year old boy, he was initially convicted under section 302, that is for culpable homicide amounting to murder. But the High Court converted the offense to one under 325 and awarded him four years of imprisonment. After going through the judgment, Justice Krishna, you are speaking for the court, says, we reluctantly confirm the conviction, quote unquote, reluctantly confirm the conviction. Now, what about sentence? And his observations on that sentencing jurisprudence, when it comes to minors and children, is an eye-opener. Because in 1977, there was no Juvenile Justice Act. Today, the situation is that a person below 18 cannot even be tried by a regular court, leave aside the sentence and punishment. And some of these observations have, in my view, paved the way for framing of Juvenile Justice Act. Let us see those observations. This 12-year-old delinquent would have had a holistic career ahead instead of being branded a murderer had a Children Act refined the statute book and the state set up children's courts and provided for healing the psyche of the little human. Nevertheless, we emphasize how important it is for the prison department to explore experiment and organize gradually 
some of these reformative exercises in order to eliminate recidivism and induce rehabilitation. We make these observations in the expectation that facilities being available and the prisoner's consent being forthcoming, he will be given under proper initiation and medical authorization courses which will refine his behavior, develop his full potential and thereby justify the justice of his forced tenancy for four years. He also observed, this mix-up of degree of culpability and quantum of punishment is unscientific and so we have first to fix the appellant's guilt under the Indian Penal Code and then turn to the punitary process. Criminality comes first, humanist sentence next. Unfortunately, in the absence of any children court, any correction homes, any juvenile justice law, the court affirmed the sentence of four years. But these thoughts are quite prophetic. Two years thereafter, another case where somebody below 18 was before the court. This time it was a 16-year-old boy who had committed an offense punishable under 325 of the IPC and was sentenced to six years of imprisonment. Perhaps after two years of experience that nothing was being done on the front of juvenile justice law, this time Justice Krishna here discharges him completely. And this is what he says. Had there been a children act, the above two accused, appellants one and two, would have received more compassionate consideration at the hands of the court. We emphasize this aspect, not merely with respect to the present case, but also having in mind the generality of cases where the sensitivity of the court and the literacy of the bar have not risen to the level where Indian children can claim that charity due to them is being meted out. He had suffered five years of imprisonment. There is nothing in the judgment which says that we reduce the sentence to one already undergone. He is simply discharged. Perhaps as a student of law, under what provision, in what manner, whether it is sanctified by law, leave aside those questions. But perhaps Justice Krishna here had learned from the experience when nothing happened with that 12-year-old boy. Now that's the translating the ideas into reality. First and foremost, justice as a concept, defining it in such a way that compassion becomes the foremost component of that. And then saying that, yes, very well, this man deserves that. And then giving him access to that concept. And as I said, these two cases, both cases, this was 18, 1980, the second case, both were before the juvenile justice legislations actually saw light in 1986. One more case, under trial. Husenara Khatun is the, is the flag bearer on this front. Soon after, Husenara Khatun is by Justice Bhagwati, this case, Montu Mujumdar, is by Justice Krishnayar. Shortly after Sanara Khatun, but what he says is also equally important. What he says is, law is what law does and not what law writes in the books beyond the reach of those behind bars. Law is what law does and not what law writes in the books. So the effect, impact, in this perspective, Article 21 of the Constitution and 167.2 of the CRPC are dead letter for each petitioner. In short, the police have abdicated their function of prompt investigation. The prison staff have not bothered to know how long these internees should be continued in their custody and most general, grievous of all, the judicial officers concerned have routinely signed away 
orders of detention for years by periodically appending their incarceratory, incarceratory authorizations. We know not how many others are languishing in prison like the petitioners before us. If the salt hath lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? If the law officers charged with the obligation to protect the liberty of persons are mindless of constitutional mandates and the court's dictates, how can freedom survive for the ordinary citizens? These persons were languishing in jail as under trial for more than seven years. They were immediately released by Justice Krishnaya. What should be the approach towards prisoners? In one of the matters, which is Rakesh Kaushik, Justice Krishnaya says, from this new angle, the hospital setting approach to prisons, Gandhiji advocated, the therapeutic, tough penologists argue for and the raising of the level of consciousness, institutional and individual, of officials and prisoners, all these woven into composite strategy may well be the highway to higher awareness and socialization of feeling inside correctional homes. This technology takes us to methods like transcendental meditation, self-expression through work, facilities for studies and artistic development. The warden's drills of the ward or the warder's billy or the VIP's good shit cannot work magic. So therefore, how the prisoners be treated? This is so far as all that we see is compassion which is giving solace to the prisoners. Sunil Batra, you say that you know, the man should be again kept out of solitary confinement, under trials getting re released, minors getting discharged. At the same time, the very same man writes Maruram. And Maruram was a case where people who were given life imprisonment. In various states, they were granted commutation after completing just about six or seven years of actual imprisonment. All these practices, Justice Krishna here writing the leading judgment, comes down heavily on that and says, going by the letter of law, you must complete 14 years of actual imprisonment without which you cannot be released. And all these policies which the state governments, various state governments had framed should give way. So compassion to prisoners is one area, but at the same time, societal interest that somebody who is guilty must serve that sentence is also present in the mind is not being just compassion-driven ideas every time. Similarly, one more case, and that's where access to justice again comes to four. Sadanantam versus Achutanandan, Achutan, Achut, Arunachalam, sorry. That was a case where, on a charge of culpable homicide, the High Court reversed the conviction and acquitted the person. The state chose not to appeal against that decision of acquittal. The brother of the victim filed a 136 petition. Leave was granted, judgment was reversed. And the trial court view of conviction and sentence for that culpable homicide charge was restored. At the stage of appeal, one of the objections which was taken was, he is not even an informant. He is brother of the victim, yes. But in law, he is not even an informant. Leave aside the prosecution. That submission was rejected and the judgment was reversed. Second round to the litigation began with a writ petition under 32 challenging the very same judgment on a collateral point that you could never have done this. The matter comes before a bench of five. Again, writing a judgment for the bench of five, Justice Krishna here rejects all these submissions. 
on what? On the principle of access to justice to even a commoner. In his view, even a commoner could actually come so long as he is not guided by any special motives in the matter. And therefore he says that such an appeal at the instance of the brother of the victim was a good, very well sort of, you know, ordained matter and we were right in accepting that appeal. So again, the man, when it comes to prisoners, when it comes to convicts, he grants them everything by way of compassion. But at the same time, not a benefit which, in his view, the wrongdoer should walk away with. Not on the ground of locus of the appellant to file the appeal. If substantively he deserves that, yes, certainly he would walk away with acquittal. So look at the, the way the man actually had the tightrope walk. On one side, compassion. On the other side, strict adherence to the letter of law in Maruram and the concept of access to justice because that victim's brother also must have access to justice. These are matters where today we, we have amendment to CRPC giving right to the victim also to file a substantive appeal. So the visionary in him, whatever he had thought of, is now part of the statute law. On one front, on juvenile justice front, on the other fronts as well. This is the kind of contribution the man has made so far as access to justice is concerned. I won't read all these passages from that particular judgment. Now we come to one more judgment of his, which is Ediga Anamma. Ediga Anamma was decided before Bachan Singh. Bachan Singh has now virtually codified the approach which must be adopted in all death sentence matters. Edi Ganamma was a lady of 24 years who was given death sentence and the matter came before this court, Supreme Court. And again that compassion becomes the throbbing idea everywhere. And this lady, her death sentence was converted to life imprisonment by Justice Krishna here. Again on the ground that that is the real concept of access to justice. Two passages, if I may have the liberty of just placing before you. Let us crystallize the positive indicators against death sentence under Indian law currently where the murderer is too young or too old, the clemency of penal justice helps him, where the offender suffers from socio-economic, psychic or penal compulsions insufficient to attract a legal exception or to downgrade the crime into a lesser one, judicial commutation is permissible. Other general social pressures warranting judicial notice with an extenuating impact may, in special cases, induce the lesser penalty. Extraordinary features in the judicial process such as that the death sentence has hung over the head of the culprit excruciatingly long, that is that Vatishwaran line which Justice, Justice Chinnaparetti had adopted and then Sher Singh which was the line which Justice Chandrachud did and then finally comes the last word on the matter which is the Triveniban law which is five judges of the court. Extraordinary features in the judicial process such as that the death sentences has hung over the head of the culprit excruciatingly long may persuade the court to be compassionate. Likewise, if others involved in the crime and similarly situated have received the benefit of life imprisonment or if the offense is only constructive 
being under section 302 read with 149 or again the accused has acted suddenly under another's instigation without premeditation, perhaps the court may humanely opt for life even like where a just cause or real suspicion of wifely infidelity pushed the criminal into the crime. On the other hand, the weapons used and the manner of their use, the horrendous features of the crime and hapless, helpless state of the victim and the like steal the heart of the law for a sterner sentence. We cannot obviously feed into a judicial computer all such situations since they are astrological imponderables in an imperfect and undulating society. A legal policy on life or death cannot be left for ad hoc mood or individual predilection and so we have sought to objectify to the extent possible abandoning retributive ruthlessness, amending the deterrent creed and accent accenting the trend against the extreme and irrevocable penalty of putting out life. Here the criminal social and personal factors are less harsh. Her femininity and youth, her unbalanced sex and expulsion from the conjugal home and being the mother of a young boy. These individually inclusive and cumulatively marginal facts and circumstances tend towards a ward of life imprisonment. All these thoughts are now part of what is Bachchan Singh. This was given even before Bachchan Singh. We have plenty of such cases by Justice Krishna here. Hoskot was a case where you say that the jail authorities must render every help to the convict to prefer an appeal. Today we have more or less codified it as a standard operating process in all legal services authorities. This was a case decided by Justice Krishnayar way back in 1980. So very prophetic ideas, very prophetic suggestions which are part of our jurisprudence now. All these cases, what do they show? Not just compassion, Tremendous ability to forge new ideas, new tools and come out with solutions which will provide succor to the needy, to the depraved, to the marginalized sections of the society. That was access to justice for this man. Once you secure access to justice, to the needy, to the poor, to the rich and poor alike, that shall be greater service to rule of law. I have all other cases which are apart from criminal law, on civil law, like Shoshit Karamchari Sangha, Fertilizer Corporation, where the concept of locus standi was expanded by Justice Krishna here. In cases other than criminal matters, these are purely civil matters or labor disputes. But the time is very short at our disposal. So sum and substance what? Great prophetic judgments given by a visionary, great service to Indian jurisprudence, so much so that, that the path shown by him, we are still treading the path. We haven't been able to forge better ideas, leave aside, we haven't even fulfilled what he had thought of way back in 71, 76. If we do that, that will be the greatest tribute to this man. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me this opportunity. <laughs>